uh, I only kind of got it going again in the autumn, last autumn, and we kind of sealed it again. And uh, this spring, it was absolutely heaving with um, tadpoles. Um, I've got just amazing videos, which just black from end to end with these tadpoles. It's amazing how wildlife will, will move in quite quickly. Uh, a few other things. My wife says I only like scratchy, um, prickly plants. I, I quite like gorse, and that's again linked to butterflies like the green hair streak, because I look at what uh, larval plants these butterflies need, and, and things like gorse have, have come to the fore of my mind. I think, well, I haven't got much on the farm. So I've been planting and trialing um, things like gorse, um, or, or things like holly. I want holly for holly blue. Um, oak trees, uh, I'd love to have purple emperor on the farm, butterfly there. Uh, in the area, but then I haven't seen them on my farm as yet. So I've planted a lot of oak trees. White letter hair streak. We're in, reintroducing elm trees onto the farm. So um, also, so, so for, strangely for me, a lot of the planting I'm doing, whether it's wildflowers or uh, whether it's uh, tree species, is all actually now got a, got a kind of insect or a butterfly in the back of my head. Um, in the future, I'm hoping we can do some arable version on some of the ground adjoining Martin Sell Hill. Uh, I'm also thinking about uh, how we can incorporate trees into our into our pastures, silver pasture, and have more trees uh, in, in our dairy paddocks. Um, and perhaps as well, we can plant uh, some infield trees into our big arable areas and have some landmark oak trees back in. We've always had a few. Uh, when they die and, and eventually fall down, we've tended not to replace them. And I think we need to put a few young ones back in on some of the big arable fields. It'd be something that uh, uh, would be a positive. Um, I put this one in and it's not, Particularly, I'm, I'm, going, I'm sorry I'm running over a couple of minutes, but I am nearly there, so I'll push on through and apologies to my other speakers. Um, this was given to me by Charlie Burrell from NEP, and I have been to NEP. I find it a deeply fascinating place, uh, and I could praise it to the, to the, to the um, highs, and I could, I, I could also criticise it, but it's a, it, it, I enjoyed it. My day there tremendously, I have to say. And Charlie did a presentation, which I went to, where he put this slide up. And I think we need to think about this in the farming context. So this is looking at, uh, you, it's fairly self-explanatory, it's got a spelling mistake on the axis, which is annoying, in, uh, intensity. Anyway, um, NEP, he's put right in the middle. So what he's saying is it, NEP's quite large scale, um, uh, it was, it's roughly in the middle it's, uh, in terms of an area scale, and on the left is the intensity of how much it's being managed. And actually, because uh, what, what he's saying is that it, some of the, um, areas like Yellowstone, the management's virtually nothing, and that obviously has massive wildlife habitat benefit but also um, typical UK nature reserves are quite high intensity so it just comes back into this whole issue of, uh, as what I'd like to think of as a wildlife friendly nature friendly farmer how intensively you manage it, um, it is, is up to you and also you've got to just be realistic about what scale you're starting on along the bottom because if, you, if you've got 10 acres or one acre there's obviously different things you're going to be doing than if you've, if you've got bigger areas you, you're going to work with um, so I think uh, People have got to kind of think where they are in terms of where they, how, how intensively they want to manage things um, for, for, for habitats and for na nature and wildlife and, and, and what scale they've got um, to reference what they actually practically can do. Um, nearly there. Key action points. Um, understand and research and explore the ecology of what you already have. Um, and the more I learn and the, and the more I explore and and study things, the more I realize I don't know, and the more I've got to learn. I'm getting better, but I, I feel like I'm scratching the surface of what I need to know about my own farm. Every time I look, I find more things. Collaborate with other local farmers, talk to them, see if you can um, do a coordinated agenda of what you want to do, uh, and then, and then uh, set, some, set yourself some habitat goals. Take professional advice, because you aren't gonna know everything, so you take some professional advice from, from, um, from, from experts to help you uh, on, on, on your plans. And then just enjoy watching uh, your projects grow and evolve, what your trees grow, your hedges grow, uh, your ponds fill with life, whatever it might be. Um, we, I have to acknowledge the good work that we've done with Pusey Down. So this link should just quickly show you, and please have a look another time at the Pusey Downs Farmers Group. Um, we've, we're lucky to have an absolute um, pro has, has worked with about 20, 23 of us, I think it is, 23 farms through Pusey Vale to actually manage wildlife uh, collectively together. And, and, and across the landscape and, and, and kind of coordinate projects. And for things like the Duke of Burgundy butterfly and the marsh fritillary, it's actually important to work together because one farmer working in isolation isn't going to be able to uh, create stable populations. We've got to work um, collectively as farmers to actually make, um, make the differences and to make sure these species have viable numbers. So now if I go back, hopefully I can get back to my presentation. <laughs> I'll go back to my presentation. I'll go back to that. I think I've 
Um, if I go, are you, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, I think uh, because I've gone to that link, it's now how I get out of that link. We can still, no, we couldn't see oh. the link because it was the um, oh, it PowerPoint that was it attached. That's fine. Okay, well, that was, that was, it was basically a journey of, um, of some of the wildlife on my farm. Um, some of the things that have been important, some of the projects that we're doing. Um, I've overdone my time, so I, th I probably will, will, um, will, will I, my next slide was just uh, to say any questions really. So that's, um, that's where we're to. That's okay. perfect. Thank you so much, David. If you, I'll just um, give you a second to stop sharing your screen. Um, and yes. we've had a few questions that have come in. So um, yeah, I'm, on, you... I'm sorry I didn't get to the last slide, but it's just a nice picture of the cattle on the hill. <laughs> okay, so any questions? So David, we've had some questions. Um, so Katie, you were asking about whether Martin Cell Hill is a triple SI. Did you want I'm to ask anything anything beyond that, Katie? Um, um, no, no, not really. It's just that um, you know, as you were describing it, it looked you know so kind of beautiful and and yeah. biodiverse, and and I just wondered if it was designated because I I work with some farmers who also have designated land um and yeah just wondering uh how you, um, how you no, no, no it's not but it, it's within within our countryside stewardship we have to manage it very carefully so um the key key thing would be like stocking densities of cattle um but we have a pretty low stocking density so it's not um so there's not, not risks of erosion on this on the escarpments um we will also have to do mixed grazing so that not just cattle there have to be sheep grazing for a period on period of the year uh, and and that sounds all very simple but actually there's a lot of chalk downland in the county that very sadly isn't grazed at all and a lot of the biodiversity goes if there isn't this isn't this grazing happening and i can uh, is i and i get quite sad to see quite a lot of the chalk down that's degraded um by lack of grazing but um that, that is sadly the case in other places but no it's not not an sssi uh, there is full public access um so there's there's a lot of you know there's a car park there and it's as with a lot of similar sites very popular for people especially this year um, to, to walk around and, and look at it um, but no it's not designated an SSSI. Very interesting yes. thanks. Thank you. There's, um, there's a couple of other questions that um, um, actually I think will tie in quite well to some of the discussion that will probably come out of the other two presentations so I'm going to hold yeah. on to those but there was just a question um, from oh, let's have a I should have said it is de does have an ancient monument it has an ancient hill fort across the top so it is protected through the um, being an ancient monument. Okay. Um, Miriam wanted to know if you are part of a butterfly monitoring program or whether you're just doing it for fun. Um, I'm, I'm a member of Butterfly Conservation, so I'm, I'm work, and, and so I'm, I work with them. I compare notes. My kind of mentor in the background is Matthew uh, Matthew Oates, who uh, is, is well known for uh, his work with purple emperors. So I throw questions at him. I think he got pretty bored early on with saying, "What's this? What's this?" So I had to get some identification books. Um, but uh, no, um, I, 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 I liaise with butterfly conservation and I like to say our local Pusey Downs uh, professionals. Um, uh, so that, that's, my, that's my kind of contact. That's great, thank you. Um, as I said, I'm going to hold on to those other questions because I think they're going to be relevant for I'm the sorry, discussion. Sorry, others, I overran, overran a little while. Don't, don't worry, we've built in a buffer for time, so it's absolutely fine. Right, um, next we're going to welcome Denise to talk about Pelham. So Denise, you're happy for me to share the screen, is that okay? Yep, absolutely, just unmuting. <clears throat> so you have, go ahead. Okay, and just bear with me, hopefully you can all see the screen okay. Is that the first slide? Yeah, it is. It's, oh. Yes. Um, no, it's not. Sorry. Okay. There <clears throat> you go. Okay. The first slide is it's a it's a title slide right at the top with our with our farm sign. Oh. Okay. Bear with me a second. So it'll be four or five slides above above that. Just give me two seconds. I'm in full screen, so I'm struggling to. There we go. Right. Sorry. Bear with me, everyone. It's a farm sign of the, of the blackbirds. Yeah, I've right? got that. I'm just struggling to get back into Zoom yeah. to now share. So just bear with me a second. There we go. Okay. Got it? Perfect. Away you go. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Nikki. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you also for asking me to speak today and it's wonderful to share 
this online platform with David and with Michael on behalf of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, of which we are all members of our respective national steering groups. Um, Peelham Farm um, in South East Berkshire. Next slide. You want to go to the next? You can see our location. We're very close to the border between Scotland and England and a long way north of David's lovely farm in Wiltshire. Um, we're very close to the North Sea and we're very influenced by our proximity to the, to the North Sea. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. The North Sea is actually to the top of that image. Unfortunately, because um, I can't quite share, my, well, I can't share my screen directly. Nikki's doing it for me. Uh, but above that line of trees, that is the North Sea. That gives you some indication of how close we are to the sea. Um, and you can see from this uh, drone image, uh, the sort of setup that we have. Um, we farm at between 700, um, at the height of 700 feet and go down to 200 feet. Next slide. Next slide, Nikki, please. Yeah, so there's a bit of a delay, Denise, so you'll just have to um, give me a second. Okay, all right, no, so thanks for that. Next slide, they click it, and then there's a delay, so just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so we're a family farm. Um, myself, my husband, our son, Angus, lovely daughter-in-law, Helen, and she's there, got class to her, our first grandson, Blake. We've now got a second grandson. And so we were into our third generation, but actually, by a fluke of coincidence, in fact, Helen's predecessors, unknown to Angus and Helen when they first became engaged, actually farmed Peelham. So um, Blake would be something like fifth or sixth generation on the same farm. Um, 265 hectares, mixed organic and pasture for life, cattle, pigs and sheep. Um, we're predominantly cattle um, and we farm store sheep. Next slide, please. From this image, which is the sort of from the south of the farm, you can see, <coughs> excuse me, we're quite mixed habitat. Um, the, the top horizon below that you could, is actually where our farm steading is. Um, and you can see the kind of topography that we're working with. And you can get a general sense, the connectivity uh, between habitats and the various fields and, and our steading. Next slide, please. So really, um, I'm presenting this as, this is a, a business case study of working and farming with nature. When we first took on the small holding, seven acre small holding, which adjoins the larger farm that we have now, Peelham, um, that was in 1990. We um, acquired Peelham with our now elderly business partner in, 1993 actually and started really working on it in 1995. Chris and I were with both new entrants to farming. We had to work very very hard to start building up our vision for what we felt it needed to be. Um, so really building assets, it's been both building our built infrastructure, our capital assets as a business but also our natural assets as a business. Um, Habitat restoration commenced in earnest in 1998 and continues right to the present. Uh, you can never stop restoring habitats. We went organic in 2005, uh, following the um, reform of the Common Agricultural Policy in 2002, and that enabled us to afford to take our ecological restoration approach even further. Next slide, please. So this image, will give you, this is a, a, this is a, um, a tiny wee bit distorted plan of our farm in 1993. It had very little going for it. Um, all of it had been farmed on short term lets um, from one year to the next. Um, the northern part of the farm, the heart of Peelham, was based on um, short term arable lets. So really from one farm uh, to the next, it was very unloved, rather dilapidated farm with a, you can see the biodiversity hotspot in yellow um, I realized from very very early stage my background is as an ecologist with a keen interest in plant um, uh, plant ecology that that was quite special um, we 
even though we started farming conventionally, we were very low input from the word go because that was very much our vision ultimately to become organic and to farm with nature. So the fields either side of the biodiversity hotspot within our tenure have never had any fertilizer. Um, you can also see very limited connectivity in terms of hedgerows, very few hedgerows. I refer to nodal connections as the point at which different habitats meet because ecologically those tend to be the points of richest species diversity. So there was something like eight nodal connections, i.e. eight connections between two different habitat types or habitat structures. Um, and edge density, uh, because again, species diversity is greatest where you have the um, diversity between two different habitat structures, even if it's the cut edge of a field or um, a hedgerow against an arable field or a hedge against a pond or a pond against a wetland. So there is something like a 31 meter per hectare edge density. So it gives you an idea of the paucity of habitat strength and cohesion on Pelham as a whole, and it really it's it's um, degraded natural asset. Also, it had very little in the way of capital asset, so we had to hit the ground running in terms of building the assets to build a business. Next slide, please. So, building our natural assets. Very quickly, getting on to planting. Next slide, please. Excavating, creating new habitats. Next slide, please. And building our actual habitats by connecting, planting hedgerows, planting hedgerows. And as organic farmers, we couldn't, not that we wanted to use herbicides, so we use very successful mulching. You can see the same hedgerow five years later um, with an, ex it's an extended hedgerow. Um, with a wide grass margin and we're, we're growing this as a thicket. Next slide please. So this Pelham 2020, you can see the biodiversity hotspot um, based on the indicator and rare plant species that I've been able to identify. We've got something like a 20% increase in its area. Um, woodland has increased by 50%. Hedgerows by 75%, standing water has increased sevenfold, and there are now 38 nodal connections, 38 connections between different habitats and different habitat structures. And we've increased edge density to 65 meters a hectare. So um, the structural density and cohesion of our natural asset has increased since 1995, as I've been able to demonstrate. And in the short term, we've have wild bird seed areas and grassland management rotation. These are sort of short term ephemeral um, habitat improvements. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Nikki. I went to the next slide. You need the next one, Denise. Sorry. Yes, We're please. On... Lovely. Thank you, Nikki. Yes, yeah, so here Is we go. Right so one? connecting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Connecting adds value. So the connection, so it's not just piggly piggly throwing in hedgerows here, there and everywhere. Actually, that would be a benefit in any event. It's actually making sure that each connection is meaningful in terms of the habitats it links. So we have a linkage between our hedgerows, which actually are the basically the core of the cohesive structure of our habitat networks and very key to building the natural asset of our farm. So all of our habitats are now connected. Um, so the greater the biodiversity, the greater the diversity of connected habitat and structure, the greater the biodiversity, the greater the cumulative benefits of um, habitat restoration. Next slide, please. Can I see it? So what I've been able to show is that um, in, a, in addition to building habitats, I've managed to be able to 
identify key indicator species. So what we've been doing is now resulting in habitat indicators which reflect on the value of our natural asset. So we've got red and amber listed birds and RSPB are very much involved in mon helping us monitor the farm. Um, tree sparrow, linnet, skylark, yellowhammer, and you can see from the list on the left. We've got, um, and we've got wetland plant specialists as well in the wetland area, four regionally rare, including the black bog rush, marsh orchid, moonwork, grass of Parnassus. National rarity, this year we've had two sightings of the corn bunting, we're one of very, very few locations on the east coast of Scotland where they breed. And um, the two sightings this year, very, very exciting. And incidentally, both linked to the wild bird seed unharvested crops that we've planted as part of our grant aided um, Scottish agri environment and climate scheme. And um, we've got wetland, red and amber listed wetland birds, the lapu, so lapwing, curlew, and reed bunting. And butterflies as well. David, you'll be interested that, you know, with the pearl bordered fritillary, um, we had the first record in 150 years here on the farm. Um, it was considered extinct. Uh, it hasn't unfortunately been seen for about four years, but it's breeding and feeding plants, the um, bugle, uh, the marsh thistle and the marsh violet are abundant. So hopefully it's just that we haven't been able to record it. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. I want to focus on a little bit on key farm habitat issues or, or assets. So I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of the value of hedgerows. Um, hedgerows actually vitalize the ecosystem function of farms in terms of water, water catchment, water management, water filtration, water holding, and carbon. It, it builds carbon, um, it increases carbon mass, and it's also involved in the carbon sequestration around its root mass. Um, so a very important ecosystem function for our farm, adding value, very important to livestock well-being, for shade, shelter, biosecurity. So it's actually linked directly to issues of mortality, live weight gain, um, and also biosecurity. This became very evident to us, funny enough, during foot and mouth disease, that where we had hedgerows, our neighbouring farms, livestock weren't touching nose to nose. And also there's incidentally been some very interesting research done by the University of Oxford that demonstrate where you have something like one kilometer um, of hedgerows per 100 hectares, the reduction of um, TB is 12.5%. So it's a very important biosecurity issue as well. It's also valuable, hedgerows are also valuable for crop protection, not just livestock protection. So um, provide refuge for pests, predators, and also shelter for press predators and shelter for crops. Next slide, please. Next, thank you very much. So that's the hedgerow. Now I want to look at key soil indices. We think of ourselves really as soil farmers. So we've evolved from new entrant smallholders with other jobs to now where we are with our son and our family farm, farming 260 hectares as farmers of the soil. And the soil is now becoming a, a very sharp focus as an indicator of how well we're farming and how well we're respecting and building the natural and also the financial assets of our farm. We've invested heavily in um, having every single field on our farm, that's something like 28 fields, um, each analyzed in detail in terms of soil. And what we're able to demonstrate that um, over the last sort of 30 odd years, we didn't take baseline indication of soil 
um, health way back in 1990, 1993. We've done it this year. And we know from the past history of the farm that um, we have very reasonably improved soil indices. The previous history of the northern part of the farm, um, peel, peel was arable. The, all the organic matter contents of all the 28 fields of our farm are above the guide with 3%. Um, we have 3.3 to 8% soil organic matter in the northern part of the farm with a microbial biomass of um, over 2,000 to over 3,000 milligrams per kilo. Microbial biomass is really important because that indicates to us the um, biodiversity of our soil. It also is a very important indicator of soil respiration capacity and how quickly the soil warms up. Very important for early grass growth and germination. Um, the southern part of the farm, which has been predominantly grass grazed um, long before we farmed here, we've got organic matter contents up to 12.6%, which is way above the 3% guideline. And we've got microbial biomass um, up to sort of 4,400 milligrams per kilo, which is enormous. With soil scores, um, and soil scores are based on biological, chemical, and physical um, indicators of between 75 and 76 percent. So we've got a very valuable soil asset, and I think reasonably we can argue that we've been improving soil as an asset in the last 30 years of farming. Next slide, please. So I've demonstrated that we've built the natural assets of the farm. I focused on hedgerows and why they're an asset. I focused on soil, why that is a very, very crucial asset. So what I want to do now is just actually focus on specific examples. Um, so indicator examples, if you like, of the direct benefits. Our livestock are healthier. We have, we're using less medication. In fact, we're using minimal medication. Uh, when we first went organic, um, within five years, we were achieving um, the same, um, very quickly, the same crop um, returns. Uh, we get up to three um, harvests of silage from our fields. We are currently, as organic pasture for life, uh, nature-friendly farmers achieving um, really good live weight gain for our cattle up to five to 600 kilos within 18 to 20 months. And that's on grass only, no grain feeding. Um, so that's a very good indi indicator. And then also a specific example. Um, we used to have very uh, bad incidents of coccidiosis in our calves, and that's a very nasty bacterial infection. Um, Pre-organic, it was high. It was a problem. We were having to medicate a lot. Post-organic, almost immediately, coccidiosis went. Uh, there was no sign of coccidiosis. And my assumption is, and it hasn't been tested, so it is only an assumption, is that we know that top dressing with artificial nitrates does depress the, pro, the, the probiotic activity in grass. And all that we can assume is that having released the grass from the, you know, the, the blanket of nitrates, not that we used a lot, we were very low input farmers from the, from the beginning, but because there was no nitrates, it's quite possible that the probiotics improved, increased as the calves were weaning, they had probiotics from the grass and they were less susceptible to coccidiosis. And apart from one or two instances since, we have not had coccidiosis. So that's a direct example that we believe the benefit of farming with nature. Um, next slide, please. So looking at business infrastructure assets, so capital assets, you can see the area of land that we have, mostly grade three and four, mostly three. Livestock, cattle, sheep and pigs, mostly cattle. Um, we've got something, we've got a, a considerable square meterage of winter housing. You can see, you would have picked that up from the first or second slide. Uh, housing includes uh, overwintering for livestock, workshop, feed store, 
for feeding our pigs. We've got a butchery and charcuterie facility. We've got farmhouse and two cottages, and we've got farm machinery. So that lists the capital assets of the business. Natural assets, we're south facing. Um, that's a forever asset. Um, we've got soils now that are in, uh, mostly in very high condition. We have 10 habitats on the farm. We've got approximately 6,400 metres of hedgerow, 15 hectares of woodland in nine separate woods, and we've planted most of these um, as we have planted the hedgerows. Um, we've increased the um, standing open water to a thousand square meters. We've got something like two and a half thousand meters of natural running water into the River Tweed. The Tweed catchment is one of the most um, premier water catchments in Europe. So that gives you an indication of business infrastructure assets, capital and natural asset. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so inputs and outputs. Um, Inputs, muck from our overwintering livestock, seed for new grass and red clover. We use red clover to um, harness atmospheric nitrogen and fix it into our soils and straw, um, which actually we import from our neighbor, most of it. So bedding straw from our neighbor, we grow our own feeding straw. We have no agrochemicals whatsoever on this farm. Um, so we basically, it's a simple input system with few cost complications. The outputs in terms, the current outputs in terms of gross margin over inputs or the gross margin on our outputs, it's 50% for the farm and from our farm to our butchery, it's 42%. No middle dealer, short food chain, a simple clear return. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, rainbows there and those two, two images. Um, the golden pot of the end of the rainbow um, is in the strength of our margin, but more than anything, in what is really mostly immeasurable natural assets, which have improved the natural asset and value of this farm, not least for those of us who live and work on it. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope, Nikki, I've kept within time. You're slightly over, Denise, but we won't, we won't be uh, annoyed about that. It was worth every minute. So thank you ever so much. Um, I'm just going to sure. stop sharing. And, um, and as I do, um, we've had some questions that have come in, which is great. So the first question I'm going to ask, um, Denise, um, there's a question around funding to carry out the work that you did. So did you, have you received grant funding or any sort of support for carrying out the habitat creation work? Yes, we have. I mean, since the word go, we've been part of all the schemes that have been available. So we've, we've, we came into farming as new entrants. You know, we didn't come into farming with a lot of money. We came in, as Chris and I, we had a small holding. We were working people, well, of course. So they, we, there was no money there to help us um, create our habitat. So we were absolutely dependent on grant aid. So yes, absolutely. The answer is yes, we needed grant support. Thank you. And one other question before we move on to, um, to Michael, which I think was from Tam, which was, it might be a question that Angus would be brilliantly placed to answer for you about rotations for your animals, because I know he's involved in some of the mob grazing work. So um, do you yes. have specific rotations for your animals? And, and if so, what are they? So we, yes, we've, we've recently, well, Angus has done the, the fence building, started rotating our cattle. Um, so we've always rotated our pigs, so we've always rotated them in a fixed field rotating between paddocks and usually nine months between each paddock rotation. We're now moving into full scale um, cattle rotation and mob grazing and this is the first year that we've started really fully with our cattle and you know perhaps discussion for another time um, we're coming across some quite interesting behavioral characteristics in our cattle as we graze them within much smaller paddocks than they've been used to um, so it's quite interesting um, I don't know if Tam that answered your question um, the sheep because we actually we don't breed sheep anymore we farm store sheep we actually we don't mob graze them but we graze them on our new seeds 
Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to save some of the other questions for the end because um, I'm just conscious of time and I want to make sure that Michael has a chance to share um, with us the work that's been going on at William Wood. So I'm just going to share the screen now. If I could remind everyone to stay muted other than Michael, because that'll just uh, mean that we don't get any sort of funny um, feedback. Uh, so let me just share the screen. And just set it up as a slideshow and over to you, Michael. Thank you, Nikki. Can you hear me all right? Sound okay? Yep, sounds perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, from the top of the M6, uh, a village called Ecclefecken that you probably, uh, you might have noticed if you drive up the M6, known locally as Fecken, which makes me the Fecken farmer, um, which is probably a better description than the uh, Fecken factor I used to get. And I don't know, quite know how they knew um, that we were going to move to Fecken uh, when I was a factor, but there you go. Uh, I'm also known as Mad Michael around these parts, um, a dangerous subversive who believes that you can actually produce food and uh, find room for nature. Uh, and I am, in terms of motivation, I've seen some of the questions about motivation. My motivation is quite simple for doing what I do. Uh, I get as big a buzz from seeing a barn owl or from hearing, hearing a curlew as I do from breeding a show calf. And in fact, if I was brutally honest, I'd probably get more of a buzz from the nature on the farm. And um, I work along with many others in the network to demonstrate that you can have both. It's not a binary choice. Uh, and I believe that farmers are uniquely placed to spearhead the transformational change that we need on a landscape scale in this country to combat the twin crises of biodiversity and climate. And I think if the Prime Minister had, was, had broadened his designation, you know, and, and expression of support to farmers, we'd be a lot further forward than if we designate special areas. So I haven't got much time, Nikki, have I? Um, that's the, the, the penalty of going last. So I'll canter through our story, if I might, the headlines. Um, our farming started really 30 years ago when uh, we left the smoke, when we left London um, for the clean air of Dumfrieshire. Uh, no inheritance, no expectation that we would ever be able to farm as a land agent. Uh, all I could do was really try and get some vicarious pleasure from others farming. So we've had to buy everything from scratch. We've had to... Um, we funded that, like Denise, from off-farm employment. We started with a few acres, renting land here, there, and everywhere. And we've ended up, after several moves, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, here at Williamwood, where we are conventional farmers. Nobody's mentioned it, but I feel a huge sense of privilege being a farmer. It's an exclusive club. The cost of entry is almost obscene. Uh, we've managed to get there. I hope there are ways of people. Well, there are ways. If, you're, if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and that seems to have been our experience. I've also feel a huge sense of responsibility as a farmer, a moral responsibility for taking care of the countryside, a sense of urgency, which I don't detect in the Scottish government, that we need to get on with it, and a sense of awe at the power of nature. Next slide, please, Nikki. Uh, nature is our business, nature helps our business, and our business helps nature. Pre-COVID, and this is obviously pre-COVID, you know, we charged people for taking them around the farm to tell them about food production, to show them how we can do the nature bit as well as the food bit. So my talk is really a lot about symbiosis, about reconnecting people with where their food comes from, about demonstrating that we're not talking out the back of our heads and that you can do both. Uh, most of our nature improvements on this farm have been funded by ourselves, by the business, by the money we've generated from our nature tourism side of things. Some of it's been funded by the Scottish Government. I have very mixed experience of working with the Scottish Government. In Scotland, the agri-environment schemes are competitive. And a couple of times, it's cost us thousands of pounds to put in applications which haven't scored enough points. And that's an, 
incredibly depressing kind of process. I think the Scottish government are looking, I know they are, they're looking at a new way of doing things and that can't come soon enough. We've had enormous help from the Woodland Trust. Uh, I've done a great deal of work under their more wood scheme, hedges and trees. And we've had Im immense help from the RSPB in terms of where to site the hundreds of nest boxes that I've made and put up around the farm. We bought the farm because of its potential. It's got massive latent potential for nature. It used to be an estate farm and obviously was set up with a long-term view, fallen into when let's say it just needed a lot of TLC, uh, immense opportunity to increase the farming productivity and to do more for nature. And as David said, we're only really scratching the surface so far. We've got a massive mortgage so we needed a robust business model. And natural capital has obviously a value for our balance sheet, but it don't impress the Agricultural Mortgage Corporation a great deal, who are only interested in cash. So we had to do what we can to generate cash. Next slide, Nikki, please. We keep um, pedigree cattle, uh, beef shorthorn cattle. We keep pedigree highland cattle. We keep the cross, the Shorthorn Highland Cross, which is a very good native cross um, for using uh, grass. We've got about 50 breeding cows. We sell the, co the, the, the calves as, um, when they're weaned off their mothers. We just don't have the space to finish them, so somebody else finishes them for us. Uh, we keep, next slide, Nikki, please. We keep native sheep, clins, because they're very prolific. Uh, they're very good on our sort of ground. Uh, golden hoof. You know, uh, sheep do a tremendous amount to improve pastures. We put a lot of store into soil analysis, a lot of store into um, storing and properly uh, middening our farmyard manure, which we spread on the land. But apart from that, we try and minimize our nitrogen applications. Next slide, Nikki, please. We have a number of holiday cottages. This one uh, was a farm shed when we took this on and I mucked it out by hand because I couldn't get a machine in to do it. We've done it up to be a four star cottage. We've got a number of others and people sit in the hot tub and they uh, look at the wildlife. It's a south facing cottage, very attractive. What it does for us is it keeps us market facing. It keeps us realizing how important it is to keep in touch with your market and to get feedback. Next one, Nikki, please. One of the first things we did um, almost caused a divorce, I have to say, but um, within two months of buying the farm, I dug out, not literally, I got someone to dig out this two acre uh, loch or lochen. Uh, originally stocked with fish, but the otters have come and eaten all the fish. It's a conservation loch now. It's a fantastic magnet for wildlife. It's a bit of our signature, it's a bit of a signature piece. We have a necklace of other wildlife ponds around the farm. Um, it's multi benefit lots of wildflowers, and we put the sheep on in the winter to eat the litter layer back. Next one, Nikki, please. I'm a self-confessed tree hugger, I guess most factors are. I plant thousands of trees a year in hedges or small broadleaf woods, largely with the Woodland Trust support. And they have, they are transforming the farm. Denise has talked about the benefits of hedges and small woods, and the benefits are huge. Frankly, I cannot believe how much natural regeneration has come from these small. That's all natural regen. You'll see a few tree shelters in the foreground, but that's all willow, which I do cut, uh, like David. I probably cut it before for me, but cut it back um, every year, mainly so I can walk through. But also, you know, we feed the willow to uh, the cattle. And um, it's a fantastic micro habitat of which we have many now around the farm for wildlife, for all sorts of um, wildlife. Next slide, Nikki, please. Connectivity. Denise has mentioned as something very important. Eco connectivity for the wildlife and in our case for the visitors. We need somewhere safe for them to be able to walk around the farm. I have, we have fenced off um, a farm trail all round this farm. So it goes on for miles and it's a hugely pleasurable job for me to 
cut the path like that with a little mower behind the quad bike. The hedge you can't see, but on the left, I planted uh, six or seven years ago. I can't believe how it's grown. It is now, I'm six foot five, six foot four, and reducing as I get older, but uh, it is eight, nine feet high. And one thing Dumfrieshire can do is, is grow good hedges. And they're full of berries this year for the birds, the bees, uh, for the wildlife. You know, it, it is an absolute pleasure to be able to walk, ride, run, whatever you want to do around the trail. And we, we go to town with signs. We think interpretation is extremely important to help people understand why we're doing what we're doing and how at the same time as doing this, we're producing food. So uh, 12 years on after we bought the farm, we've got a resilient business. COVID's given it a bit of a knock and we hope that um, we don't get too many more knocks from that. We've got measurable progress. Our vision is of a productive and profitable farm. Um, buzzing with biodiversity and we're getting there uh, in an environment attractive to visitors and wildlife and with a reducing carbon footprint. We would like to do it quicker. We could do it quicker if the Scottish Government would show the same commitment to agri-environment support as it's just done to forestry because I guess like many of us we believe that mixed land use is a better way to combat climate change and the biodiversity crisis than blanket commercial conifers. Final slide, Nikki, please. You see that? Uh, I joined the, we joined the Nature Friendly Farming Network when it was set up. It helped us realize that we're not completely mad, that they, we're not alone, that there are many others of you out there who share our vision we share our determination to see a better way of farming, who are prepared to stick our heads above the parapet and speak up for nature and to engage with politicians and the public like we are today. If you haven't joined, we'd be delighted if you would. Thank you for listening. Excellent, Michael. Thank you so much. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. Um, and I can see that we've got a couple of questions um, and one from Miriam, you were asked, um, Miriam would be interested in, um, you mentioned agro-tourism and getting people closer to where their food comes from um, and she'd like to know who are these people that are coming to the farm and where do they come from? All sorts of people. Um, we open to community groups, so local people, uh, special interest groups, you know, the bat group, uh, um, what do you call the, the, the um, people who are interested in mosses, all, all sorts of, anybody who asks um, can come. We have people, casual people who turn up and obviously people who come to our cottages and bus tours, all, all that and everything. I, I, I feel quite bad actually about taking money, but um, you know, we have got this mortgage to pay. And so uh, people don't seem to mind if you charge them really just something that covers, you know, a bit of the cost of doing it and something towards your fuel. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes left for the session um, and there are some questions that were coming through. A couple of them are on particular themes. So I thought we'd um, just pull those together. Um, there was a question around um, the inspiration. So, you know, Michael, you mentioned this in your in your talk just then, but the inspiration to move towards nature friendly farming for you, David, um, and also what was the, um, the motivation to start you developing habitat work, Denise, um, and the link between that and your work as an ecologist. So it'd be interesting to hear the, the motivation and inspiration behind this work. So maybe if we go to David first. Okay, um, well, first of all, um, I'm a family partnership, so it's not me making all the decisions. And you know, we, we, we've always um, decided the direction of the farm as a family. Um, but for me, um, uh, it was like I said, a journey really of seeing, you know, Father started a lot of the hedge planting and I got really interested in that and, and, and planted the trees and other things that he, that he did. Um, and uh, that kind of really kind of piqued my interest and, and, and uh, loved, to see, loved seeing those parts of the farm evolve. Um, and uh, like I say, more recently, it's been like a, a passion for the insects on the farm and working out what I can do to, to improve um, the future of all the, the kind of rare insects that we've got on the farm. 
Um, so I've started to look at the larval plants and the trees and things that we need to plant, just, just really to understand ecology. I think I had a pretty good education on how to farm a farm and how to grow crops of wheat and how to kind of get lots of milk from cows. Um, but the ecological part of the farm wasn't in depth, you know, in depth part of my training. And it's something that I just do find really interesting now. And, um, and I get a lot of, a lot of kind of rewards and satisfaction um, from some, from things, seeing things improve. And I think all of us want to try and leave farms um, in a better state than when we, we started farming them. And definitely um, we're doing a better job than we did 20, 30 years ago. But still for me, it is also important to find the balance between some intensive agriculture, which with the people we need, we have to feed, we're still going to need. And there is a, the problem is if we uh, move completely away from all intensive forms of agriculture, um, that may bring some benefits, additional benefits for wildlife, but maybe also just put some of our production abroad and defer some of our production to other parts of the world. So I think we have a responsibility to produce uh, reasonably as much of the food that we need in this country um, as efficiently as we can, um, but also to, to, to kind of share uh, our land as best we can with wildlife with margins and field corners and all those kind of things, but also where possible to, to spare some areas as well to be completely for wildlife. And like I said, I'm sure um, the journey we're on um, will, will progress and I hope the ELM schemes are such that you know, in 20 years time we, we've got, gone a lot further on um, down the road. That's great, thank you. And we're going to come back to the question around intensification and um, land sparing sharing and, and inputs in a second. But Denise, do you want to just quickly share with us your kind of inspiration and motivation for particularly around habitat creation? I mean, it's, it's, it's been lifelong, really. Always loved plants, you know, always got about the garden. Um, I was born and brought up in Central Garden. There was always something to guddle. And I think going, going from a guddling childhood to a very faulty schooling and eventually, eventually to university, I still maintain my love and absolute passion for ecology and the mystery and the magic of it and being able to recreate it. Uh, you know, Michael mentioned the privilege of being a farmer and actually we have got an incredible privilege and we have that, we have a responsibility to, um, to that privilege, which is about restoring ecology and restoring biodiversity. So yeah, it was just the passion really is a, is a profound love and respect for nature more than anything. Thank you, that's, that's really lovely to hear. And um, I'm not sure that word was gu guddling. I don't know that one. <laughs> that's a great word. <laughs> lots of lots of mud anyway. <laughs> <laughs> great word. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I wanted to come to the question. There was a question, David, when you were talking about um, the chemical inputs around the wild bird um, cover establishment. And um, I don't know if anyone in the in the session follows David on Twitter, but you'll always be in for um, kind of a, kind of some interesting and maybe potentially provocative tweets. I think from David, which I, I always find fascinating, and there's always a good debate um, when they come up. So David, I'm really interested in expanding a bit more on what you were just saying about intensification. Yep. Um, to ensure that we can produce crops in an efficient way, but also managing that land sparing aspect and, and where the use of various chemical inputs sits for you in that debate. Um, well, for, first of all, um, we should always minimise the amount that we do use. And, and you know, I'm, I'm the first to admit there are negatives to the use of nitrogen fertiliser on the farm that we, we, we use. Um, and there are negatives to, to some of the sprays we use, but it's a complicated picture. If you look at me, uh, I mean, I'm lucky I'm just selling off some, some milling wheat and we've achieved the premiums for that and some milling wheat going off the farm. If I hadn't used the fertilizer inputs uh, on those crops, if I hadn't used uh, the fungicides on those crops, they would never make the grade. So it is the catch 22 that we have. Um, now I have lots of ideas. I would love to have a way where there was um, take wheat, where there would be the possibility of having um, schemes where you could grow what I call conservation wheat. So it wouldn't be organic. It wouldn't be fully conventional with all the inputs, but there may be a possibility where you could grow um, wheat where you kind of plant it with corn flowers, where you plant uh, other kind of wildflowers in, in the mix. It would re reduce the yield. Um, you may have to clean it to a cleaner before, it, before you can sell it on, um, but it would have biodiversity benefits. So that may in the future be the, a, a kind of idea that, that there may be ways that you, you would do, use much less herbicides. You'd accept that you'd have weedier crops, but weeds, uh, you know, a weed reduces the yield, but a weed is actually often a food 
plant for, for, for our wildlife. So I understand that. So for me, um, I'm still working it out. I think we're all still working it out. I, it, I think technology can, can, can play a part because in the sprays in the future, we'll probably have um, a lot more kind of, uh, kind of like magic eyes and they'll look down and they'll see where the specific targets are. So if you go across the field, it'll turn the nozzles on and off just on the little it places where you need to use it rather than blanket treatments. And so suddenly then you might use 10% um, of the herbicide that you're using now because it will just target the specific areas. So that would be a plus because you're not blanket treating. Um, about five years ago, we introduced GPS uh, into all, the technology into all our spraying. And that again, dropped the inputs 10 or 15%. And that's great. Uh, and, and we're also trying to use insecticides very, very rarely. So we pulled a lot of insecticides out of our system now. And obviously the neonics have gone, so that's happened anyway. Um, but this year we made, made the decision, uh, a classic example, not to use insecticides on our spring beans to try and control brucid beetle. Um, so that, that was um, insecticide. I tend, to, I tend to try and do it in the dark. It was a lot of work in the past years. The downside to that is that I'm never going to probably, now the, the, the beans we've harvested are full of brucid beetle uh, and they're only going to make feed grade. So it's another ir irony that if I had used the insecticides, which I don't want to use, I've decided not to, potentially I could get 20 or 30 pound premium and those beans could make the grade for human consumption for the market when they go off, off to Egypt and all those countries. Because my beans are now harvested with quite a high level of, level of brucid beetle, um, they're, they're going to be used for animal feed. So that's an example of where I've made the decision not to use an insecticide and that's good for wildlife that's got to be a plus but there is there's a potential cost um, to the premiums i can achieve on the crops i harvest um, but in my in my head i said i always think i always use this example of a, of a dial uh, which isn't very helpful but you can see my finger but you, you you can you could turn the if you look at all my kind of cropped area and say it's 100 percent and, and you can turn the dial up to have more of, of that um, at the moment it's about eight percent is actually used for wildlife habitats um, I'd be quite happy to see that go up to 15, 20% if there is some no support to do that. Uh, I can do more arable reversion grass, uh, grass and like flower meadows next to the chalk downland. Um, I can do 20 meter margins instead of six meter margins. I can do two or three hectare field corners instead of just like half a hectare. So you can see how you can um, get my farmed arable area, still be using inputs on, on less of that for high output but use you know, a bigger proportion of that cropped area for wildlife habitats. And I think we've got to kind of get that balance right. Um, and like I said, there's a whole journey of more trees, which I'm all on board with, have more trees into our farming systems. Uh, obviously we've got to manage it. There was you know, all those good talk, comments about uh, how, how to look after soil. We've all got to get better and with our cultivations and how we manage our soil, cover crops and uh, all those other things. So um, I've probably talked enough. That's, I, you see, I'll take the whole time up, but um, it, it is a and I, it keeps you awake at night because you know using inputs has a negative has negative effects. Um, but not you. I, I also have an eye-watering seven-figure farm mortgage I've got to pay, which will be there probably still long after I'm gone. So I have to still be commercial, um, and, and I still have to show a profit at the end of the year. And I haven't yet found a way. And I and, and, and with respect to Denise, I, I'm not convinced organic agriculture is right for me. It, it, I've seen a lot of farms uh, on our on similar um, green sand soil type to us and they've really struggled to make organic farming work. It may work for other people and it's something I always constantly look at um, but, but, but it's not, it's not, I don't think it's the right path for, for us but yes less inputs definitely uh, and try and find that balance. That's great David there was a question that was asking about whether you'd consider going organic so thank you for answering that at the same time and I think your point about sustainable intensification is really interesting. I, 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 I don't think organic is right but I, I could, I'd be really happy to find a way of growing uh, on, on a year basis where I grow a crop of wheat and perhaps I you know within a conventional system grow these conservation wheats where I say right I'm not going to use a herbs, any herbicides on them maybe just a very very low dose of fertilizer and then if you plant it and then you could you could you could plant and put into into the mix in the spring loads of wildflowers and you, and you can have all, you know have crops of wheat full of and then you leave the stubble so it's following spring crops so all those flower plants would leave seeds for all the birds through the winter so there's ways we could still um really find land sharing where we're growing crops um that, that actually are better for wildlife and, and you know, I, have, now I haven't seen any cornflowers on my farm because the wheat the herbicides are too damn good but i'd love to have fields of wheat that have have some of these wildflowers back in them and that that would be possible it wouldn't be organic it wouldn't be conventional it'd be somewhere in the middle and i'm sure there's a way we can find ways to do that kind of thing 
That's great, thank you. Um, Denise, I want to ask you um, kind of off the back of David's comment about um, food grade, uh, like human food grade and then animal feed grade, but as somebody who um, is PFLA certified, so Pasture Fed Livestock Association, uh, your animals are not eating any um, kind of crops or cereals, um, your cattle and sheep aren't. So can you talk a little bit more about the kind of move towards that and, and what that has, if there have been any business implications or nature business implications that you can share with us? Yeah, thanks, um, Nikki. <clears throat> well, you know, as I demonstrated in my presentation, um, we're achieving very good live weight gain with our beef. Um, and we're maintaining weights for our sheep. Um, obviously, pigs are monogastric, so they have to be cereal pulse fed anyway. Um, so we're not, but that's as much a factor of the location of the farm in terms of its, its altitude um, as anything else. But we haven't suffered as farmers either going PFLA or organic. We're achieving the, the um, live weight gains that actually conventional farmers aren't achieving in the same area. So we're quite pleased with that. Um, going PFLA has open markets and it's a very important aspect of selling direct because we can actually promote what we're doing and people actually just, there is a growing market for people wanting both organic and uh, entirely grass fed. But I mean, may I respond to a wee bit of what David has said, if I may? Please do. Um, I love, I love David's vision and approach. And quite honestly, the way David farms should be the norm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's great to actually, David, what you are wanting to aspire to. Uh, but I think in terms of, um, and in fact, actually, you're, you're very nearly organic, and I'm not proselytizing for organic, but if we take the word organic out of it, um, you know, there's a shortage of organic cereals. Um, organic cereals are paid a premium. There's a good market for organic, for, for cereals grown organically. And at the moment, we're having to import organic cereals from Ukraine. So it seems kind of crazy that we're not producing more of our own indigenous organic cereals. Um, the, the, there's that point. The other point about the, the moral obligation to, to growing food, of course, that's very important. And I don't think the way we farm is inefficient. I don't think that we could produce more food from our farm. And I think by, um, but I do think that actually we need to address the issue of waste. You know, 40% of waste, that's, food that's eaten is actually thrown into a garbage can. There's a very, very big issue there. And I think before we start peddling intensive, uh, um, um, sustainable intensification, we've got to look at waste. Um, but certainly, I think within the organization, David, Michael and I, we're all going in the same direction which is farming with nature. But I think we can go a lot, lot further. And um, we don't have to be called organic. We don't have to be called PFLA. We don't have to be called anything. We just need to keep nature in mind and keep farming with it. And it has untold benefits, that most of which actually we can't measure. We can't put a financial value to, but are still immeasurable. And you only need to have listened to David Attenborough on Netflix the other night in his witness statement to know how very, very important it is and that we have no time left. And if I can just say one other thing, flying a flag for farmers, that as farmers, we've got the, we've got the capacity because of the land we farm, the area we farm, to make the change, to make the vital environmental restoration that we simply have got to do. It's now about capability and capability is an issue of mindset and know-how and um, NFFN are going in the right direction we need to go in that direction much more quickly so there we go Denise thank you so much what um what what a lovely sentiment thank you and it, you know I think it, you're absolutely answering the question that was asked um a second ago about how do we continue to sort of spread the word and help more farmers to do this and, and like you say you know kind of highlighting good case studies the work of the NFFN and other organizations who are who are working hard to do that is is clear and evident and um yeah it's really interesting to hear we have got four minutes left so I would like to ask you to be as succinct as possible in your answers I wanted to talk to you about water quality I've had the joy of standing next to Michael's lovely lock-in um, that he put in and I did want to kind of 
expand on that a bit more, but I think we're going to run out of time. So instead of asking about water, so you could use water in your answer, um, I'd like each of you, and we'll start with Michael this time, um, maybe just to give uh, two or three key points that people could take away today in terms of nature-friendly farming. Oh, you're on mute at this moment, Michael. Is that better? Perfect. Yeah, well, I, I just to repeat the appeal, um, if you haven't joined the network, do please, because the stronger our voice, the better. Um, you'll know, Nikki, that we're getting traction. Um, we're punching above our weight in Scotland. And my goodness, we need to. You know, we know that um, junior ministers are in our favour. Senior ministers are concerned about not upsetting the traditional old guard. Um, we don't want to upset them either. We need to demonstrate by what we do that it is entirely possible and it is the only responsible way forward, really, for future generations to farm like this. Thank you. Denise, would you want to just give us a, one or two lines um, in addition to what you've already said? Okay, so I want to show consumers, we're all consumers, um, whether you're farming, whether you're a farmer or not, buy where you can from nature-friendly farms. The more you buy, the more you grow the market, the more we can farm in a nature-friendly way. Farmers open up to the capacity of your farm and its natural asset. And we can demonstrate, and the report that we published, the organisers published today, can demonstrate that we can farm and farm even more than David's doing. David's doing an awful lot, and so Michael. We can do even more. We can do more, a lot more, to farm with nature. And we need to do that, and we don't have the time. We've got to move very, very quickly. Thank you, Denise. And David, um, just final words to you. Uh, two or three just points to finish on in terms of um, encouraging others to engage with, with the sort of work that, that you, Denise and Michael, are undertaking at the moment. Yeah, well, um, firstly, we can't, like I say, do these things alone. So like I say, I mentioned when I speech went a bit wrong uh, at the end about Pusey Downs farmers, but working collaboratively with other people has been good from the social point of view to meet other farmers not very far away. Um, but also we have to work at landscape scale because even those with the biggest farms, um, with, with a lot of the kind of populations of, of, of uh, red listed species that they aren't on a big enough scale to, uh, to, to make positive change. So people have to work collaboratively. And obviously beyond the cluster group, um, Nature Friendly Farming Network's been a uh, real opener to me. I've visited some wonderful farms and met some amazing people. Um, you know, in the background um, behind uh, what, what all our farms, we've got this, this horror of climate change that I'm afraid is with us for, for a long time and is going to accelerate. Um, so uh, we, you know, we, we need to do everything we can on our farms to kind of basically um, make them more resilient for the changes that are coming um, because we know the weather's getting more extreme. Um, you know, we're getting uh, you know, extreme heat waves and, and, and wet periods and everything else. So uh, nature also plays a big part to make our farms more resilient in, in that sense. Um, and, I see, and I see the importance of, of within our farm mixed farming and having those grass pastures and how good they are for the, for the soil. And, and like I say, to make, um, make, make our farm more resilient to extremes of weather. Um, so uh, yeah, we need to work to collaborate. We need, we need to work collaboratively through um, Nature Friendly Empowerment Network you know, to help us get through these, these, these future events that we're gonna have, these weather events that are gonna get more and more extreme. Uh, and, you know, and for the wildlife on our farms, it, we, we, we haven't had the right priorities in the 70s and 80s and, and through to the 90s. And so we need, you know, we need to get the balance right um, for between the wildlife on our farm and, and the food production uh, and, and obviously that has all these implications for our health and our general well-being. Brilliant, thank you David. Right, we're bang on three o'clock so thank you and um, we'd like to echo um, the point that I think Tara just made which was a very inspirational presentation from the three of you so thank you so much and thank you to all of our um, participants who joined us this afternoon, really value your time and for coming to hear what we had to say. Um, I've put the link to the report that was released today um, on Nature Means Business by the NFFN, it's in the chat so if you want to have a read of that report then, um, then please do just follow the link and thanks everyone for joining us. Important. Thank you, everyone.